were freaking out, huh? If I would have sang that song, it would have been on. <laughs> you might just have to turn me down. I'm feeding back. Testing. Testing. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Good. Good. And then there's that. Just turn me down, I think, is the problem. <laughs> Testing. One, two. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, see how we get prepared here? It's good. This morning about uh, nine? No, it was last nine. We just didn't say. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, I mean this morning. Uh, here's what happened. Last week, Brandis takes her brother into her class, and, and uh, she throws him under the bus and makes him basically do the class. So I thought, wow, that's a good idea. So when Brandis got here this morning, I said, hey, uh, guess, what? guess what I need you to do today? I need you to talk with us. And so that's why we're all sound checked and ready to roll. Because um, here's why we're in a marriage series. And what we've been talking about is the things that cause marriages to fall apart. And the last, last week we talked about how finances really cause our marriages to struggle and to fall apart. And... Uh, Man, you're going to have to cut my lows. I'm sorry. It's just, yeah, it's beating back like crazy. No, it's my mind. There you go. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, last week we were talking about finances and how, uh, how uh, finances seem to destroy a lot of marriages. And uh, hey, how many of you guys have seen that either in your own marriage or in marriages around that finances are just a huge struggle in marriage? Yeah, it's... It really is. I think some of the biggest fights we're in, I mean, we're in. We were in. Are over finances. Were, like, you know, past. Last night. <laughs> He's got a lot of de uh, deposits he needs to make. I'm just going to let y'all know. So, in my love bank. Why is it that the guy is always that has why to make he the deposit? Is broccoli and cheese soup? You knew. He was no, setting me up. It wasn't even worth it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that that wouldn't even be worth making broccoli and cheese soup for. God, that's disgusting, man. Uh, it, I have to leave the house. I can't stay inside the house with broccoli. It's horrible. She'll come to bed like... <sighs> All right. Covering my head up. I love you, baby. You. You're getting deeper, baby. You're going deeper. No, that's how much I despise it. Oh. And then I go and make it, and I stayed in the house. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and I didn't, say, I didn't even grow up much, <laughs> did I? You anyway, gagged like two anyway, times. anyway, you're wasting time. Okay, okay. Back to the, yeah. We, uh, we were talking about finances, and uh, this week I wanted to talk about the second thing that are, I don't think these are in any particular order because we see them all the time, but... I've seen this destroy marriage after marriage after marriage after marriage, and it is addictions. Uh, I think the hardest, the, the closest we ever came to just cashing in was, was dealing with an addiction that I was going through. And uh, if you would have asked me then, there's no way I have an addiction. I mean, nobody ever has an addiction, right? I mean... It's not that bad. It's just something I do. I can, you know, I can stop anytime I want to. It's not that big a deal. Only thing was, it's not, uh, what, here's what I found about addictions. It's not the being able to stop part. It's the not wanting to. It's, it's not, it's the not, the, the I just can't stop. I mean, that is, there is, there is that level of addiction. But in, in a lot of time in marriage, uh, as it pertains to destroying your marriage, you just choose the addiction over your spouse. You get so numb to what the addiction does. The reason it's so dangerous is it numbs you so bad that you start to stop caring about, well, pretty much what anybody thinks. And you are so, you just become more and more self consumed and more and more self focused. And all of a sudden, it's like, I don't care if I meet our needs. And I sure don't care if she meets mine because I got. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. <Yeah. Swipe. laughs> 
Uh-huh. Hey, man, say. shopping addictions are just as bad, so don't. <laughs> that sounded like a familiar voice. It did. Um, so that's why I asked Brandis to come. Now, a lot of you guys, Brandis has been up here a lot telling her story, and but there's a lot of you guys who are new here. And so you don't know, uh, this is Brandis Wilson. She's our children's pastor here. Uh, <laughs> She is my oldest daughter. Um, it's hard to explain. I had to explain to somebody who she was to me this week, and I'm like, well, she's like my daughter, but older. <laughs> kind of in between. She'd be my daughter if I had a daughter at like 10, <laughs> which would be weird enough, right? She'd be even more messed up than she is. Now, <laughs> Now, um, her and her husband, Chris, came here, and when they came here, Chris was an alcoholic, just a, I mean, just full-blown, uh, um, just an alcoholic, uh, and, and uh, their marriage was over, and, uh, and Chris be, became, he was radically transformed, he became our children's pastor, and um, about a, uh, almost two years ago now, in February, uh, Chris, we lost Chris, he had a um, we didn't just lose him. I mean, he, he died. He didn't, we just hadn't found him. I mean, we know where he's at. Um, uh, but uh, Chris had a, a ruptured aorta, and he just, uh, he just, we lost him suddenly. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the greatest thing about the, the story is, is that Chris, even though he struggled with a lot of his life, man, the end of his life was just, inspiring i mean he he just absolutely was contagious how many of you guys lives were just totally affected by chris i mean it just golly he just touched so many people so so fast and so it's such a great story but what i wanted brandis to come talk to you about is brandis was a young mother had a baby at that time um and Chris was um, an alcoholic, and and Chris was, if you knew Chris, his personality really came out when he was drinking, and so, he, but I mean, he was so bad of an alcoholic, like he carried a backpack with him. He used to tell me about, he managed uh, Golf Galaxy in Plano, mm -hmm. and he was, I mean, he managed the store, but he always carried a backpack full of booze everywhere he went. I mean, like, I can understand, but I don't understand being an alcoholic and needing to go to a store, but he had a backpack on him all the time. So uh, anyway, I wanted her to kind of talk to us about what that's like. And here's the goal today. I'm just going to lay it out before we get started. The goal is I want to encourage you. If you're in a marriage with, with someone with an addiction or maybe you're both in an addiction, there's hope. There is hope. It's not over. And when it comes down to it, man, love can conquer anything. And, and God is so much bigger than the things that we think are just impossible. So if you're here today and you, you think your marriage is over and you think there is no hope, and maybe you've already gone through divorce, it's not, it's not over. There's hope. There is hope, okay? And so I just wanted to let Brandis kind of start and share. I remember... Uh, the first memory I remember really of Brandis is when she came here with her family <laughs> and we met in that back room I don't even know if it was a nursery back then it was some classroom I think but we met in this back room after service to talk about Chris and basically what the gist of it what I got was she was here to to one get an answer from us should she stay or should she go basically everyone said you get out of there now like all everyone's telling her to leave and so she came back there, and she sat in that actually, room. And I remember actually, our aunt came to me and said, I need you to tell Brandis to get rid of him. <laughs> like, all right. What happened? <laughs> well, um, they didn't tell me to leave him. And um, as I've told you all my story so many times before, I was mad at him for telling me 
are not telling me to leave him. Um, but in that moment, you know, he tells me, well, basically that divorce wasn't an option. And I looked at him and I... Well, first thing I asked her, I said, do you love him? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, I mean, if you don't, it's going to be impossible to do what you're going to have to do, right? Right. And the love that I had for Chris, which is something I'm sure you can relate to, it was just, um, we were high school sweethearts. We had, you know, grown up together, really. And so we'd grown through so many things of being um, dysfunctional teenagers to becoming dysfunctional adults. And um, the love that we had, though, it was just, it was captivating because it didn't matter how much mess he had put me in and what all he had done. And I, too, to him, there was no, like, okay, I'm done and I'm just walking away. It was never easy to just walk away from him. Even before we had kids and everything, I just couldn't walk away. And now, of course, I'm thankful that I didn't. Give us an example. Okay, just... I know there's a million, but give us an example of what life was like that brought you to the point of where you just... Okay. Um, well, the addiction had been going on for a long time, and I had been in the addiction with him for a long time, yet whenever I had a child, everything changed for me. And that's when I realized the addiction, and I realized, whoa, this is way out of control. And um, so I started changing and things started happening, and he started changing all right, but he kept going. And um, so things were happening. His job was starting to suffer. Um, bills were not being paid anymore because you've got to buy the alcohol to take care of the addiction before we can pay the bills. Um, the final, final moment was when um, our daughter's safety was put in jeopardy. And um, to this day, I still cringe at the fact that this happened but it's part of our story. And, um, you know, he was an alcoholic taking care of our daughter. So my daughter, you know, when you're in an addiction, you're not all in, you're not all present, you're not thinking. She was a year old and he's taking care of her for long periods of time by himself. He would pick her up from school, he would take her places. And of course, in my, you know, naive state, I was like, he would never drive with her in the car while he was drinking, but I didn't realize how much the addiction had consumed him at that point, and that he couldn't see her anymore past his addiction. All he could see was his need. He couldn't see her needs, and so at that moment, I realized it was my job to take care of her, and so when I came and I talked to them, yes, I wanted to get out, but I didn't really want to leave him. Um, I needed to know that I could safely pull us away from him to give us some space. And I hoped in that space that he would see what he was doing. And it was my job to protect my kid. I am her mother. God gave her to me for a reason. And he knew that I had everything that I needed to take care of her. And so it was my responsibility to say, I'm not going to let you do this to her. You've done whatever you wanted to me, and you can do anything you want to yourself, but I will not let you do this to her. And that was the turning point. That's when I came here. Um, like, I moved. I just left our house and cars, jobs, everything. I just left and came here, and I needed to find a foundation. I needed um, something that wasn't as shaky as all the world around me. When... Uh when Brandis came to us, Chris was telling me that when she when she left, she moved back to Canton, and uh, he stayed in in uh, Plano where he was at. They had bought a house, and uh, he said he was living there without electricity, <laughs> and I think he lost his job, and he was losing the house, and he still was walking because he didn't have a vehicle to the liquor store to get alcohol to come back to a house that was being repossessed without electricity. That's how far the addiction had gone. And in my um, thinking, I thought if I could control all of the elements that help him to live, then he can't function anymore, right? So I was so desperate to save him, unknowing that I was never going to save him. You know, and so I thought, okay, fine. So I called the bank and I was like, you can have our house. Here's the keys. I don't want it anymore. I'm not going to pay on it anymore. And so I don't know what you want to do about it, but here you go. Um, 
there were some legal things that happened and it ended up selling. But um, electricity, I called him, it was in my name. I said, I don't live there anymore, can you turn it off? And so they, they did. And same thing with the water and the car. Um, I just took it and he didn't have insurance because he had already been convicted of a couple of DWIs by this point. So he couldn't drive it, so I took it. And I just left him there thinking he's going to call me in a couple days and be like, babe, please, I can't do this. I'll go to rehab. I'll do whatever you want. But Chris's personality was pretty, um, well, I know it didn't seem like it at the time, but there's a lot of love to be able to care for someone so much that you stop stop enabling them. Mm -hmm. Do you realize how much she was enabling him to continue if she continues to do everything, he doesn't wake up and see, because when you're in that addiction, man, you never realize it's that bad. You can't see from anybody else's scope. I don't know if, you, if you've never been in addiction, you can't, you can't understand it. But when you're in that, there is no way possible for you to see from somebody else's scope until you get hit in the face with a shovel. I, I mean, it's just not possible. So that's what kind of where... Uh, she stops enabling Chris and 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 so then the road starts to like she comes and talks to us and I said if you love him then then you know I'm not telling you to stay with him I'm not telling you to to continue enabling him but I would just take divorce off the table I, I would just say look you know it's not <laughs> this is an ideal marriage by any means but I would I would just say I'm committed to you and, and then when we started working toward his health, mm -hmm. which is hard when he's done so many things to hurt you, you know? Yeah. I had to look past my own pain. And that was a really, really big turning point for me because I realized I had to stop looking at Chris and his faults. And it was time to start taking accountability and ownership for me and my faults. We didn't get to this place just by, our, by him doing those things. I had a very active role in putting us in this place too, whether it was enabling him or whether it was getting him back for the pain that he had caused me. And I was really good at doing that to him. It, it's, it, you may have experienced it in marriage whenever you get hurt, mm -hmm. your reaction, you knew how. Oh yeah, I knew they, how you to knew hurt it, him. You know how, you know, was, you, exactly. know, you know those sore spots that you just like, I know this will get him, bam, you know, you just know where to do it. And it's awful to say, but I did that, you know. I mean, that's what we do to the people that are closest to us. And in some dysfunctional way, we think or we know they're not going anywhere. So it kind of made it easy to do that. It's a way to deal with not having mm -hmm. to forgive. Mm -hmm. and, and we teach on forgiveness, and, and one of Brandis's life messages is about forgiveness. And, and uh, forgiveness, as we teach on it, what you have to understand is forgiveness is your freedom. It, it's your lifeline. If you hold somebody in unforgiveness, you're holding yourself in prison. And as long as you're willing to, to just let it go, I, I mean, Celia and I, a lot of times, just say bygones, like she wouldn't last night, but she needed to. <laughs> but you got to just, you got to, you got to be, I think forgiveness has to become a lifestyle. I mean, I think we have to forgive. Jesus' teaching on forgiveness was like 70 times 70. He wasn't saying, you know, keep numbers till you hit 490 and you're out. He, he was like, it, it's got to be a continuous way of living. We have to learn to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And for the same offense. Oh. Yeah. Damn. Even though they're doing the same thing over and over. Well, you don't know how many times he's hurt me. Well, did he nail you to a cross? I mean, I seriously doubt it. Most of you look pretty, like you're pretty good shape. So I seriously doubt if anybody got nailed to a cross. And as they were nailing Jesus to the cross, what does he say? Forgive. Forgive them. They don't understand. Because what Jesus knew was that by holding unforgiveness, he imprisoned himself and lost the kingdom. But in living that forgiveness out, he enters into and remains in the kingdom of heaven. So, so as Brandis starts this journey... How did it begin? I mean, somebody, probably Celia, I don't remember exactly, but somebody showed me a book about um, Power of a Praying Wife. And it was the first time that I was able, well, first I thought it was a book that I was going to start praying these like magic prayers. And Chris was going to be instantly changed. I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I was thinking. The magic wand book. <laughs> 
Uh, Who's this, read this book? Who has read this book? This this book, I, I, I've never heard anybody who's gone through this book who didn't say it changed my life. And you would think, and here's a, as a husband's point of view, <laughs> it's like this is the magic book that, and, and what it looks like is this is going to be the book to show you how to manipulate and change your husband. Mm -hmm. But it's not, is it? No, and Chris would say that too later. He would always be like, guys, if you ever see this book laying around your house or <laughs> hidden somewhere, you better get ready because your world is fixing to be completely and radically Celia changed. read it, but I think it was power of praying wife, power of praying mom, power of praying <laughs> everybody was jacking my life up. <laughs> it was amazing, uh. though, because I didn't know how not to focus on Chris. And so this book... It walks you through each of these areas that you can start praying. And I had plenty of chapters that were like pages falling out and highlighted areas because I was like, this is the area that we have to focus on. But what it did was it showed me that in that area, what my role to be his wife really was. It showed me um, how I could pray for him, yet how I could take an active role in my own healing for um, restoring our marriage. And so it was really, really huge. Well, when Brenda starts praying, God starts moving in kind of weird ways. What happened was uh, Chris got another DWI about about that time. He had actually Chris had started. He came to church, yes. and uh, I guess did he move down here? I guess yeah, he, he finally had. Option. Yeah, he finally um, had to move. Um, he couldn't. Stand he came it to church. I met him back there when the coffee shop was in that room. I met him back there. He was so hungover. Yeah. He was hurting so bad. I wanted to just. I felt bad for him. I just wanted to hold him. Say it's going to be all right. See, he had that effect on people. I was everybody, like, get over and sit in a chair. You're fine. Him. And don't breathe on anybody because I don't want him to know that you're still drunk. <laughs> that was the reality. But he, he came some, and he, and he started coming a few weeks, and, and it may have been a couple of weeks. I don't know how long it was, but then he gets another DWI. Yeah. And when he gets, this is his third DWI. And third. He's, he was determined. He's, uh, he's jacked. He's going down, like. It's it's game over. This is this is the third time he's driving without a license. Mm -hmm. He's he's, I mean he's messed up, right? And uh, there's no way out of this one. Well, I don't remember. I think it was before before he went to jail where he was where God started really moved in his life. Well, first I want to put that he did go to jail, and I refused to bond him out <laughs> because. Not enabling. I was done enabling him. And for me, that was the safest place for him to be. And in some ways, at the same time, I was like, maybe he'll find Jesus in jail, you know? And so I left him in jail for I a very... I found Jesus in jail. Well, he found me. I, was, I didn't have anywhere to go look. For a very long time, I left him there. And that was probably one of the hardest things that I had to do to... Um, was because I would go and see him. And it was the guy that I was in love with in the worst kind of situation ever. And so my heart was broken and I just wanted to like, you know, say, I'm going to get you out right now. I'm gonna save you like I always have and everything's gonna be fine, but I couldn't. And I knew that I couldn't because at this point I had started hearing from God about me, him and how all this was gonna play out. So I knew he had to stay there. So he was there for quite a while. And then finally one day, well, and I also didn't have finances to get him out because. This was his third, and it was going to cost a lot of money to get him out. But somehow, during all of this praying and stuff, something happened one crazy day. I felt like today's the day I'm supposed to go get Chris out. I don't have any money. I didn't have any way to ask anybody for money. Um, so I go down there. I've never done this process, really, without him telling me what to do. I mean, he'd always call me from the phone and be like, hey, go here, do this, blah, blah, blah. Well, he didn't know anything about this. And so I find a bondsman. I'm like, hey, I don't have any money. Can I get my husband out? And he's like on crazy amount of bond. And he was like, sure. Um, so I was like, well, it's his third DW. He's like, oh, we could have some obstacles. I'm like, see, I knew it. Never mind. And um, anyways, crazy stuff happened that day. Chris walked out of jail. And that was the major turning point for him. Um, he had sat there for a long time. He did have time to like become clear headed to where he could think. And then he started getting plugged in here. He started coming to church. And it was while he was in jail that he did, you know, do a little bit of reading, a little bit of what is the point? What am I supposed to be here for? Um, and so I'm gonna try and talk and do something at the same time, but. 
um, he would write me letters, and he sent me this letter one time, and I, I just moved recently, and so I'm going through boxes right now, which is really hard to do, and I'm pulling out Chris's stuff, and I came across a box that has all these letters that he had from jail, and um, you know, it's that moment, do you read them, do you not, do you want to go there, do you not, because it's going to be pretty painful, and you know it is, but us women have a way of being like, sure, why not, let's torture myself and make myself cry today. <laughs> So I did, and I was reading through these letters, and I stumbled across something that I was kind of floored by, and so I'm going to try and share it with you guys. Um, one of the things that he said, he at this point, he doesn't know what he's looking for. He doesn't know what's the point to anything, but he made this statement randomly in a letter talking about our finances. He, like, randomly says, to be living life without God is like not living at all. It's like just going through the motions, but living with God makes you alive. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's in jail, and he doesn't know what he's even saying. And so I'm just like, wow. And then on another letter, totally different day, again, randomly just kind of put in between other sentences, he said, I read some of John, and I need you to help me with it. I have a hard time understanding. The word of God is God, and if you don't have him, you have nothing, no matter how much money or how many things you have. And then he goes on to randomly talk about daily life for him at the time. But why that is so significant to me now is because even when Chris didn't know what he was looking for, even though he didn't know what it was that he was searching for, he was searching. And so... God reveals himself to us in ways that we might not know at the time. And if you're sitting here today, or you're watching this, or you're listening, or whatever, it's because you're searching. And you might not know, but it's like Celia said that one day, you know that you know there's something else. And that's exactly what Chris was saying. He knew there was more. He knew there was something beyond his addiction. He just didn't know quite yet what it was. And of course, when I read it that day, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish he was here so I could be like, hey, you knew, you knew what you were talking about before you even knew. You, but. you know, like, this is something, though, you don't understand because, like, as you're going through it, your power praying wife, and mm -hmm. you're going through it, and we're praying, and, and your family, and everybody, everybody was, and everybody loved Chris. I mean, yeah. drunk or sober, <laughs> everybody loved him. So, well, not everybody. Yeah. I mean, he was kind of, when he was drinking, he was kind of not nice. But, uh, it, the thing is, everybody was for him. And, uh, and she's, we're praying, and we're not seeing any results. But when you see this in this letter, out of our, like you're not preaching to him, God's, God's working over here. And that's why your marriages aren't hopeless. Like you don't know what somebody's going through. From your perspective in the physical world, man, things suck and things are getting worse. And a lot of times in, in the physical world, what I've seen is when addictions are coming down, things get a lot more intense and a lot worse. Like the marriage gets more confrontational and, and conflict and there's a bigger struggle and everybody's more irritable and, and everything's being pushed because nobody likes to change out of an addiction. Well, and no one likes to be told yeah you better change when, when it's God know? doing it you just get miserable and you get miserable at everybody I remember just being so angry and frustrated and so she was the only one I had to like mm -hmm. so I'm angry and frustrated at her yeah. and uh and really it's just God dealing with you and you're not wanting to you know and something you can take home right this second though is if you're living in that situation where your husband or your wife you know, is in an addiction or whatever, something you can take home right now is stop nagging them. Yes. Stop preaching at them. Just stop. You'll never change anybody. I've learned this 12 years of being a pastor. What I've found out is I've never changed one single life. Right. Well, and like for me, I was nagging at Chris and I felt like I hated Chris. Like I felt like, oh my gosh, I don't even like this guy anymore. And so that's what was making it easy to want to divorce him. You know, but it wasn't that I didn't like Chris. It wasn't that I didn't love Chris. What I hated was his addiction, but that had nothing to do with Chris. He was still the person that I had fallen in love with. And so once I was able to stop being like, well, I'm just leaving him because it's him, 
then once I took that off the table, it changed everything because, I mean, he was the one that I loved. And so it was the addiction that was the problem. And so that's what I started praying against. Wasn't for Chris to, you know, like have a magic change or whatever. It was for that addiction to be broken and to be released and for it to just leave him alone. So while he's out, when he gets out, he's, uh, he's reading his Bible. He's laying in the floor at Brandis' mom's house and he's by himself. And this is the way I think it happened kind of this way for me. And probably if you think back, uh, it, you know, when God resurrects us, transforms us and changes us, it's very, I don't care if you're in a crowd or alone or whatever it is, but it's extremely personal. Like, uh, like everything else just goes away. It's like just, whoosh, and then it's just you and God. And, and, and uh, Chris, we talk about all the time because we had such a similar just, I guess when you're really in the, I mean, the seventh circle of hell, it's a lot more radical transformation. So like, so it was just, we, we talked about it and it was such, our stories were so much like when God, it was just one of those, you know, yeah, I know. And, and when we had that, you know, that, that common connection, but but that wasn't the end of the story because he was transformed. He was, he was changed, and he was radically changed. I remember he comes up on a Wednesday night and says, I want more of God. And can you, like, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember I looking at him like, all right, you are welcome. I don't, I don't know. I told him, and I tell everybody, I don't know how to do that, but, but uh, we just did what the Bible says, and so it just, I don't know. But he was good, and I was good, so. Everybody lived through it. And, uh, but there's still, I mean, he's still got his third DWI, right? And he's still, uh, he's going to jail. So he gets ready one morning and uh, kisses Gracie bye. Mm -hmm. And he's going to jail. Yeah. So, he's going for a long time. You know, there's consequences to the choices that we make even after, you know, transformation. And so we went that day and um, it was so crazy. We had to drive out of town. We had to drive an hour away, and it was just silent because he had just kissed his daughter by, and um, he knew that he was facing probably about 10 years in prison. And so how do you prepare for that? You know, um, I finally had just gotten him back, and um, it was finally real, and he was just this amazing guy. And um, how do you prepare for that? So we go, and I, he told me I could just leave because he said, this is it. We hugged, and he goes to the front, but I couldn't leave him again. I just couldn't leave. I was going to just sit there until they took him away, and that was the only way because I couldn't willingly just walk away from him. And so all of a sudden, they're talking to him, but I'm at the very back, and I can't hear anything, and I don't really know what's going on, but he looks back at me with this crazy look on his face, and I'm like, what? what's happening, you know, and um, anyway, the short story of that is that he comes, he just walks back there to me, and I'm like, oh, we get one more hug or something, I don't know what's happening, and that's when he told me they could not find any record of his previous DWIs, and it was being classified as a misdemeanor, first-time offense. And that doesn't happen. <laughs> I mean, like, that's, that's not like the way it works. <laughs> I mean, that's not, house. you don't lose DWIs. You lose rape cases in Florida. You don't lose, <laughs> no. But Sorry, that was the shot. evidence to us at that moment. Like everything completely, like it just felt like we were just showered with this mercy. There's power in the name of yes. Jesus. Yes, and Amen. so, I mean, because he knew going over there, riding in that car, he said, it doesn't matter what happens today. It doesn't matter how many years I get. I'm going to go to prison and I'm going to tell everybody about what just happened to me. That's awesome. And so we were like, okay, you know, I'm thinking, wow, that's serious, you know, and so he was looking at it from that perspective. Why I was still looking at it, you know, from a wife and a mother perspective, like, oh my gosh, you're leaving. But he was like, regardless of what's fixing to happen to me, I know who I am in the one who created me. And so I'm going forward doing what it is that he's going to have me do in this circumstance. And when I come out, get ready because we're moving forward. And um, so it That's all changed. That's a pretty changed. positive attitude going to prison for two years. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, the, the thing about Chris is once God changed mm -hmm. him, man, that's who he was. Chris becomes, 
Chris starts growing and reading his Bible, and he's a sponge. He's just like around all the time. He's like, what's this mean? And have you read this? And, and it was like just, and if you ever ever around him, he'd just wear you out. Like, he, he, was he always like giving you puppy. stuff to read, you know? I remember a couple came to him, and he said, go read the first 11 chapters of Matthew. That's what he tells them. Like, I'll answer he, all your questions. And, and uh, it, it's like, that's, he just was so passionate about knowing God more. And he grows in, and, uh, and there's better ways to get in children's ministry than his path, but he becomes our children's pastor, and, he, and he just, he's just... Man, Which is crazy because um, he really didn't like kids very much before that, and so whenever he came and he told me that, I really didn't know what to say, and I thought he was joking. And so I said, well, that's so cool that God told you that, but he didn't tell me, so... Have fun. Um, I had tried to get him involved here so many times before that, and he just really had no interest. And um, anyway, so yeah, God said, go get involved in children's. And the reason that I think that he had such a passion at that point was because he wanted to make an impact in the next generation to show them that no matter what kind of home they're growing up in, it is not hopeless. That just because he had overcome all these obstacles, he had gone through so much that there is hope, you know, and he wanted to be able to show kids, like, this is who I was, and this is who I am, and you don't ever have to go that road that I went to be who you are and the one who made you. He, he had been, you know, Chris had been raised by his grandfather, he's had some family problems, his father died when he was, when he was young, and, and so, uh, I mean, you can't have excuses, but you understand how life works out sometimes. You do what you, you know to do, and, and nobody, like, goes to high school and says, hey, I think I'm going to be an alcoholic. <laughs> when I, no. You know, it, it was just kind of the way it turned out. And, uh, and he was so changed, and he was so passionate, and he, and he was leading and encouraging and moving here, and, and it was just an unbelievable. And, and the day that, that Chris— Can I say something? Yeah. For— um, women in this situation um, hold on. Um, for so long I had led our family for so long I was the one who took care of our finances and I am very very unorganized don't tell anybody but I don't know how I did all that but it was because I had to and so I paid all the bills I was the one with the really um you know, the schedule, making sure everybody was where they needed to be and all of that stuff. For so long, I was the one who covered for him, made sure that nobody really knew how dysfunctional we were, or so I thought. And so when his transformation changed, it was time for me to take a back seat and fall into submission under the authority that God had created. It was time for me to let him be the husband who was willing to lead us and not try and keep doing it just because I had done such a great job of it. Um, and I was very thankful. It's a hard thing to do because therefore in the very beginning I was like, if I give him this, then he's going to mess it up. But I had to have faith in the one who was transforming him, the one that was leading him. And so once I took my perspective off the way that he had always messed it up when I let him do those things and put it on, okay, God, you've got this. You know where you're leading him. You know where you're leading our family. That submission became a lot easier not always like beautiful and stuff but it was easier and towards the very end I was so thankful that I had this husband who was willing to ask God hear from God and do whatever he heard from God regardless of what it looked like to anybody else and I had this complete faith in him I had this um, honor to my husband because I knew that he heard directly from God and if he said it we did it because I knew where he was getting um everything from he was completely abandoned to to god just yeah. i mean he did crazy things like yeah. i mean whatever god said he just did it well and as a woman mm -hmm. you know and I, I and i can't say this is true for every single woman but as a woman what is it that we want we want a godly husband i mean boil it down that is what you want because you there's so much trust in that you know there's so much trust in having a godly godly man so Chris, uh, he's going along and everything's cruising, and and uh, one day he just gets up and says, uh, "I'm not feeling good. I I gotta be back in a little bit." And we go. He he ends up that unfolds, but one of the 
one of the neat things is like the way he was so radically changed the last thing he said to me and and I don't did you get to talk to him again after that mm -hmm. so like the last thing he said to us was like just like when he was going to jail no matter what happens he wasn't looking at his circumstance he was looking at what what God who God is not what he was going to get out of it and he he just told us like God loves you and he said no matter what happens just know that God loves you like don't lose faith in God because of what's happening to me and and then you know that was it that we you know we didn't get to talk to him again and uh, and that's how radically he was changed and that's how that's how he went f from being in hell and I know we talk a lot about oh man I, I'm gonna go preach the gospel and get people saved there's nowhere in the Bible that the Bible says go get people saved go get people that's not in there like you're not gonna see that Jesus says go and teach them everything I've taught you what did he teach them he taught them life he taught them how to have life in God how to live and how to navigate this world and what Chris discovered was that there was life in that, but he was in hell. He wasn't going to hell. He was in hell. And he was resurrected from that pit of darkness and transformed and changed and given life. And you will never, ever convince Chris that, that he wasn't brought out of hell into the kingdom of heaven. And he, I never heard Chris say I got saved. Not one time ever. He was like, I was resurrected. I was transformed. And he, that's the way he said it. The thing is, and what I want you to get, is had Brandis reacted like we normally would want to in there, our flesh, who knows where the story goes? And you don't know. You don't know where the story goes. If it's like, I'm done with you, I'm out of here, you know, enough's enough I mean not only am I stopping enabling but I'm done because it would have been so much easier just to walk away and start a new life yeah. because I mean you you know when you're in marriage you not only have to deal with your junk but you got to deal with the person you're married with junk too right and it, and it seemed like on the surface would be easier just get rid of him and his junk and I think sometimes you know when you look back I know the kind of bitterness, I know the kind of anger and unforgiveness I would have walked in, not just for him, you know, like I would have been like, oh, well, it's his fault that we got divorced. And, you know, I could have ran my mouth a lot about all of the things that he had done, but I would have also had those same feelings towards myself for just giving up because of the love that I had for him. So I think as you look at it and and we're not telling you to stay in a bad situation if there's if there's especially if there's drugs or alcohol in the home your children are in danger or abuse or you're being beaten or you know you never know when the cops are going to bust down your door don't stay in that situation okay i'm not telling you to no. stay in that situation right there's ways that you can create separation without being like okay well i'm done and i'm not you know gonna put any more into this there's ways that you can create healthy boundaries so that you can focus on what needs to happen and you can seek counsel and you can you know do different things so that you can say what do i need to do because i don't want to quit this marriage i don't want to give up i want to fight for what i know is possible even though everything around me looks impossible one of the resources that I don't want to just resource you, uh, the main thing we want to do is encourage you that there's hope, but also want to resource you. Um, uh, power of praying wife, power of praying husband, basically power, they got power of praying everything. I mean, you can go find it, same writer. Uh, power of praying, though, is, is excellent because of the focus is on you mm -hmm. and your walk and and in trusting God with what is out of yes. your control. You already know it's out of your control, right? I mean, that's why you're so frustrated. You can't control it. Well, that's when you can trust God with it. And it's not a magic, stupid church thing that, oh, yeah, it's the Christian thing to say. Just trust God with it. No, you trust God with it because he's bigger than our worst problems. 
The other book you just mentioned, Boundaries, uh, Dr. Cloud, I think. Uh, Boundaries is a great book because it, it's a great book and a step-by-step -step guide in how to set healthy boundaries to stop being an enabler. And there's boundaries for kids and boundaries with teens and just bound, but just, just the boundaries book, especially, especially if you're an insecure person. And uh, the problem is with insecure people is that we, insecure people are usually the most controlling people in the world mm -hmm. because they're so insecure they have to control everything and everybody in their lives. So it seems like it would be opposite, but it's not. Uh, insecure people, have a hard time setting boundaries because they need everybody, they need, they're in everybody's space, need everybody in their space, and need to control every situation. And Boundaries by Dr. Cloud is an excellent book on helping you see, just seeing where, you know, where you're struggling with setting these healthy boundaries to be able to recover. And something else, like, that I always want you to understand when we talk about addictions my story and a lot of other stories have a lot to do with alcohol and drugs, but addiction is addiction, and it comes in all kinds of different forms. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, that's not my story, sometimes you have to think, what is your story? And so sometimes you have to take a look at what could the addiction be? And um, controlling that OCD, um, perfectionism. pornography. There are tons of addictions. There's a million things that we're doing. Addictions are, are, what they are, are things that are harmful to you, that sneak up on you, that you enjoy, that turn around and then control you. They dictate your life. Here's, here's a good way to know if you're struggling with an addiction. If you can't go somewhere or do something because you've got this, like me and Chris talk about this all the time, we wouldn't go to a movie because you couldn't drink. But we go bowling, right? Yep. So it, it would dictate where we went or who we went with, who we wanted to be around. If, if you want to only be around people who do this, then it's because you have an addiction in that area. And, and uh, it's a good way to if start. If you won't answer the phone because you can't say no, might be a problem. Yeah. So it, it, it just, the thing is with any addiction, those are things of the flesh that God is so much more powerful than. I didn't go through a 12-step program. Chris hated. He would, he, he would go off if you mentioned 12-step programs to him. Because it's one step. When you're radically transformed, when you are radically changed, when you are lifted out of the pits of hell into the kingdom of heaven, everything dies. You, the Bible says it this way. You are a new and different person. You're a new and different person. I'm not saying you can, not, you can be a Christian and not have addictions. You can. But you also, in that, know the power that, that you have is greater than the power in the world. So what you do in, in that case is what you're choosing to do. You just do it because you're choosing it. Mm -hmm. Where before you're resurrected, you are a slave to it. And you can't even... I don't know how to say it, but you can't even comprehend that it's that way. Like, from your perspective, it's, it's so natural to be in hell. And I mean, it's not enjoyable, but it's natural, you know? It, but when you resurrect, it's like your eyes are open and you can see and you experience and you're like, dead people don't know they're dead. Right. The only time you know you were dead is when you're alive. I, and I don't know how else to say it. Like when I was dead, I didn't know I was dead. I was just doing what dead people do. But then I was made alive, and I was, the it's whole like time I was like, wow. You know, if you I put was a, dead. What was it if you put a frog in like regular water and then you boil it and boil it? And they never jump out. But if you put them in hot water, they jump out? No. Kind of like that. Well, and a lot of times I think we live in circumstances. That's weird. Who would do that? <laughs> I just Who heard tried I've never that? done that. I just heard that. I think um, a lot of times, too, like we've been in certain dysfunctional areas of our lives for so long that, um, especially if you're dealing with addictions, did you grow up in an addictive house? Did you grow up in addictive environments that we've been in them for so long that they almost feel normal? So to be outside of that area feels abnormal. And that was a lot of what we struggled with. And so because we had known, that's all we had known for so many years. So um, whenever he did have transformation, it was kind of like, now, 
Now, now what, what do, do we do? do? Yeah, I mean, it I was real those. awkward at first. And so if you're here and you're kind of in this in-between place, there are tons of things for you to do. And there are lots of people that are dealing with the same thing that you're going through. You're not the only one. And I promise there's nothing that you can say that's going to shock anybody that's already gone through that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I don't always share details of everything, but we've got some crazy ones. And so you can't share something that's going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that. And so feel free to find somebody that you can talk to. I don't know that I would have been able to have the kind of counsel that I received if I wouldn't have been and of course, I didn't consider it brave or whatever, but to go out and be like, hey, this is our mess. Can you help me? Can you tell me something? Because I think a lot of times we would rather keep it in the dark and not let anybody know how dysfunctional it is. But how are you really going to have healing if you're not willing to put yourself out there? It's the thing when we talk about counseling, it's the thing we've been talking about from the start of the series. And I want to just leave you with this. Uh, you have to do the work. That's all there is to it. It's hard work. It's hard work. We can't do it for you. At our church, counseling is not a long process. Chris, Chris was the greatest counselor ever because he'd be like, why are you doing that? That's stupid. Quit doing that. I mean, that was pretty much it. Or read the first read, 11 chapters of Matthew. Yeah, that was it. I mean, the thing is, 13, 13. 13 chapters. Uh, but it's like Brandis came to us for counseling. Well, we, we're going to establish this counseling. No, it was like, do you love him? Then stay with him. I, I mean, here's some books. Read them. Let's do, it. do the work. She had to do it. We didn't fix her. We didn't help. I mean, there, there was nothing we could do. So you need to do the work. There's a million resources. You need to do the work. If, if you want the life, you have to do the work. Nobody can do it for you. You can pay millions of dollars for counseling, for rehab, for everything else. But Chris will tell you, he was adamant about 12-step programs because he went through so many. He was like a veteran. <laughs> and the thing was, they didn't work because he didn't want them to. He didn't want to do the work. When it came down to life or death, when it came down to resurrection, though, he was resurrected and changed and never touched another drop. We talked about it. I've never had that desire again. It just, the desire left. And, and I mean, this is a guy carrying a backpack of booze around with him, man. I mean, that's serious, right? So, all right. Um, hopefully we've encouraged you. Hopefully we gave you enough to help you out. Um, uh, you know, we want to pray with you. Uh, just write on your cards, you know, uh, if you're struggling in your marriage or addictions or whatever, uh, we, we desperately want to pray over those cards and pray with you through those things. Uh, you know, I encourage you, I encourage you that it's not going to be easy. It's real great setting up here on the back side of it. Yeah. When you're going through it and it's day by day, man, I'm telling you, this is Sunday and everything's great on Sunday. But Monday's coming. Tuesday's coming. It's hard out there, isn't it? it's hard to keep it together. I mean, we're doing a marriage series and I don't think we fought as much. It's unbelievable. She just irritating the dog out of me. God's but it's working on us. Now. now, the thing is, there's still a life going on and when you're in the middle of it, man, it's hard to, it's hard to see. That's why you need these resources. You need something to keep you focused because I guarantee you, if all you're doing is coming here on Sunday and going until next Sunday, it's not enough to keep you focused. By Tuesday, you're going to be unfocused and you're going to be going, man, forget your needs. What about my needs? And, and, and that's just the way it's going to work. It's easy on Sunday. Sundays are great. Everybody's, everybody's in on Sunday. But Mondays are tough. So let me pray over you and... Uh, and pray for you. God, I just thank you so much that you've just given us the, the lives that we've had. God, that you've given us opportunities to, to share this life.